Quiz time. All right, everyone. This one is for the sports fans. Let's pick your brain and see if you got what it takes. Keep track of your answers, and in the end, we'll see if you can call yourself a sports expert. We'll start off easy this time. Does anyone know who this person is? A. Cristiano Ronaldo. B. Jadon Sancho. C. Zhao Felix. Time's up. The answer is Cristiano Ronaldo. Here's another easy one. It's just part of the warm-up. Who is this athlete? A. Frank Ribery. B. Arjun Robin. C. Kingsley Komen. The answer is Kingsley Komen. This one is for real football fans, or soccer if that's what they call it where you're from. A. Pele. B. Dennis Bergkamp. C. Frank DeBoer. And the answer is. Dennis Bergkamp. Which striker is this? A. Luis Suarez. B. Robert Lewandowski. C. Kareem Benzema. It's Luis Suarez. Did you know that? Which boxer is this? A. Mike Tyson. B. Floyd Mayweather. C. Muhammad Ali. You guessed it, that's Muhammad Ali. Can you guess the name of this tennis player? A. Rafael Nadal. B. Novak Djokovic. C. Roger Federer. Yep, the one and only Novak Djokovic. Which F1 racer is this? A. Daniel Ricciardo. B. Max Verstappen. C. Lewis Hamilton. This speedster is Lewis Hamilton. Who is the man behind this iconic shot? A. LeBron James. B. Michael Jordan. C. Dwight Howard. Yes, it's the one and only Michael Jordan. Can you guess who this is? A. Tom Brady. B. Aaron Rodgers. C. Rob Gronkowski. That's right, it's Tom Brady. Hear that? That's the rapid count. Quick guesses for the football and soccer fans. Three, two, one, go. A. Messi. B. Angel Di Maria. A. Danny Alves. B. Marcelo. A. Erling Haaland. B. Kylian Mbappe. A. Mohamed Salah. B. Sadio Mane. Did you guess the answers correct? Messi. Danny Alves. Kylian Mbappe, Mohamed Salah. Do you know who this soccer player is? A. Becky Sauerbrunn. B. Megan Rapinoe. C. Mallory Pugh. It's the World Cup winner, Megan Rapinoe. Who is this basketball player? A. Kevin Durant. B. Stephen Curry. C. James Harden. Yep, Steph Curry. Which shot stopper is this? A. Marc Andre Terstegen. 
B. Thibaut Courtois C. David De Gea It's the Spaniard, David De Gea. Which Olympic gold medalist is this? A. Michael Phelps B. Isabel Wirth C. Jason Kenney It's the Aquaman, Michael Phelps. Which defender is this? A. Virgil van Dijk B. Thiago Silva C. Sergio Ramos It's the Brazilian legend, Thiago Silva. Which Sergio is this? A. Sergio Busquets B. Sergio Romero C. Sergio Aguero It's FC Barcelona's one and only Sergio Busquets. Who is this tennis player? A. Venus Williams B. Serena Williams C. Valentina Carvalho It's Venus Williams. Who is this golfer? A. Rory McIlroy B. Phil Mickelson C. Tiger Woods It's Phil Mickelson. Who is this dunker? A. Shaquille O'Neal B. Yao Ming C. Sean Bradley Yao Ming Who is this UFC fighter? A. Conor McGregor B. Nate Diaz C. Khabib Nurmagomedov It's the unstoppable Khabib Nurmagomedov It's time to test your club knowledge Which one has never played for Liverpool FC? A. Javier Mascherano B. Mario Balotelli C. Eden Hazard The answer is Eden Hazard Who is still playing with Borussia Dortmund? A. Marco Reus B. Ilkay Gundogan C. Usman Dembele It's the loyal Marco Royce. Which Real Madrid legend is this? A. Raul Gonzalez B. Cristiano Ronaldo C. Iker Casillas The answer is, they all are! Which football coach is this? A. Pep Guardiola B. Jose Mourinho C. Carlo Ancelotti And the answer is Pep Guardiola Who's this Olympic snowboard winner? A. Max Parrott B. Su Yiming C. Mark McMorris It's Mark McMorris sloping down those hills. Which NBA player doesn't play for the Houston Rockets? A. Anthony Lamb B. Josh Christopher C. Dwight Powell
The answer is C, Dwight Powell. He plays in the same state, but just a different city all the way with the Dallas Mavericks. Who is this WNBA star? A. Brianna Stewart B. Jewel Lloyd C. Candace Parker It's the one and only Jewel Lloyd from Seattle Storm. Which baseball player is this? A. Juan Soto B. Mike Trout C. Mookie Betts It's the powerful Mike Trout from the LA Angels. Who doesn't play for the LA Lakers? A. Dwight Howard B. Troy Brown C. LeBron James Troy Brown, he represents the Chicago Bulls. Rugby fans, this one's for you. Who is this guy in the picture? A. Antoine Dupont B. Hamish Watson C. Tag Furlong It's Hamish Watson Who is this cricket player? A. Virat Kohli B. Rohit Sharma C. K. L. Rahul It's Virat Kohli. Can you guess this German football player? A. Serge Gnarby. B. Manuel Neuer. C. Leroy Sané. This is the unbeatable Manuel Neuer. Who is this gymnast? A. Simone Biles. B. Michaela Maroney C. Kerry Strug It's the amazing Michaela Maroney Can you guess who this striker is? A. Zlatan Ibrahimovic B. Karim Benzema C. Maro Icardi It's the charming Zlatan. No one can beat Zlatan but Zlatan. Who is this Olympic medalist? A. Bayat Foyce. B. Johan Clary. C. Matthias Mayer. It's Johan Clary. Did you know it? Who is this snooker player? A. Mark Allen B. Ronnie O'Sullivan C. John Higgins It's the sharpshooter, Ronnie O'Sullivan Who is the richest footballer here? A. Cristiano Ronaldo B. Lionel Messi C. Faik Bolkia The wealthiest football player in the world currently is Faik Bolkia. His net worth is around $20 billion. He comes from the Royal Brunei family. Ice hockey fans, it's your time to shine. Who is this guy? A. Sidney Crosby B. Connor McDavid C. Patrick Kane This ice sprinter is Sidney Crosby. Who is this skateboarding legend? A. Tony Hawk B. Rodney Mullen C. Tony Alva It's Tony Hawk grinding on the rail. Gnarly! Which Brazilian football player is this? 
A. Ronaldinho B. Ronaldo C. Rivaldo It's the ever-smiling Ronaldinho. Football trivia time. What does wearing the number one jersey mean in football or soccer? A. You're number one on the team. B. You're the best goal scorer. C. You're the goalkeeper. The answer is, you're the goalkeeper. Who is this player wearing the iconic number seven jersey here? A. David Beckham. B. Raul Gonzalez. C. Cristiano Ronaldo. It's the famous Cristiano Ronaldo or CR7. What does the number 10 jersey represent? A. Box to box midfielder. B. Playmaker. C. Striker. The answer is a playmaker. Even though it's traditionally meant for playmakers, the most talented player on the field often rocks the number 10. Just look at Harry Kane. Who is this South Korean footballer? A. Lee Kang In. B. Chang Hee Chan. C. Son Hee Young Min. It's Tottenham's lovable Sonny. Which NBA legend is this? A. Larry Bird. B. Allen Iverson. C. Kareem Abdul Jabbar. It's the GOAT, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Which former NBA player decided to try golf? A. Charles Barkley. B. Michael Jordan. C. Dirk Nowitzki. Michael Jordan was the one aiming for the hole in one. Which NBA player starred in a Hollywood movie? A. Derek Rose. B. James Harden. C. LeBron James. The answer is LeBron James shooting hoops with animated cartoon figures. Which former wrestler is flourishing in Hollywood? A. The Undertaker. B. The Rock. C. Rey Mysterio. The Rock, or otherwise known as Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Which NBA player is originally from Spain? A. Pau Gasol Saiz. B. Manu Gano Billy. C. Eduardo Najera. The answer is Pau Gasol Saiz. Which major league soccer club did this player sign for? A. LA Galaxy. B. New York City FC. C. Real Salt Lake City. David Vea signed for the New York FC after playing for Atletico Madrid. What strange sport is this? A. Curling. B. Bo Tao Chi. C. Toe Wrestling. This strange sport is called curling, and it's even played in the Olympics. Which country plays this sport? A. The United Arab Emirates. B. Egypt. C. Japan. The answer is the United Arab Emirates. 
falconry is an ancient sport dating back almost 2,000 years. And here comes the final bonus question to test your history skills. What ancient sport is this? A. Mesoamerican ball game. B. Su Chu. C. Javelin throw. This ancient sport is the Mesoamerican ball game, which has no official name. It was played in Latin America hundreds of years ago. So, what's your final score? Let me know in the comments below. Watching a football game is exciting enough. However, what's more exciting is watching a match where things end up weird. During a match between Austria and Denmark, a mysterious hole popped up from nowhere and stopped the game. The players were furious but also confused by this weird deep hole. It was a Danish player who brought this to everyone's attention when his leg got stuck. The hole was deep enough to consume his ankle. Luckily, he found it before the game started. Such a situation led to a career-ending accident. He was just showing everyone how deep the hole was. On top of that, the match was delayed by 90 minutes due to a power outage. The fans were confused. Some were frustrated that the team they wanted to support couldn't play, while others found it amusing. During a game between Colombia and Brazil at the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, a giant green locust decided to land on James Rodriguez's arm right after he scored a penalty. The player didn't notice at first. I guess that green guy was a huge football fan, or the locust just wanted to congratulate him in its own way. It's certainly not the first animal to appear in the middle of a football game. Another Brazil-related incident happened when two local clubs were going head-to-head. -head. While the game was in a heat, a dog decided it wanted a piece of the action. It got in the game and furiously went for the ball and turned it into its chew toy. The players were left stunned and agitated with the dog disrupting the flow of the game. Eventually, the officials intervened and spoiled all the fun for our little doggo. In 2006, during a Champions League match between Villarreal and Arsenal, a little grey squirrel zipped across the pitch near the striker. It was also probably just a huge fan. Ever heard a group of foxes invading a pitch? In Dens Park, a bunch of foxes decided to dig around the pitch, probably on the lookout for rabbits. Diego Maradona is one of the best football players in history. The Argentinian was quick, energetic, and wowed audiences all over the world with his passion. However, in a quarterfinal match between Argentina and England during the 1986 World Cup, things went too far when he extended his fist in the air and punched the ball only for it to go behind the opposition's net. Much to the fans' fury, the goal stood. The refs didn't have a clear vision of the goal, even though they should have kept their eyes on the ball. The Argentinians were up one goal and the match eventually ended 2-1 in favor of the Argentinians. They eventually lifted the cup, which solidified Maradona's presence as the greatest of all time. One of the most unforgettable nights was Brazil versus Germany during the 2014 World Cup. Both are giants in the game both with star-studded players ready to make their country proud. Both teams were crying out for different reasons. Brazil conceded a whopping seven goals on their own turf. The Brazilian fans were furious during this historic moment. Germany ended up lifting the World Cup with Argentina as the runner-ups. The Champions League final in 2018 between Real Madrid and Liverpool was one of the most anticipated games of the year where Liverpool was eyeing victory. Their goalie, Loris Karius, was in tip-top shape, but that night was not his night. The team and fans across the world were shocked when he made not one, but two costly mistakes. The first one was when he accidentally passed the goal to Real Madrid striker, Karim Benzema, near the goal. Karius recovered the goal and didn't see the striker nearby. He miscalculated his pass and awarded the goal to Madrid. The second mistake was when Gareth Bale let loose a curling shot where Karius could have easily caught the ball. But instead of that, he tried to deflect it and the ball slipped past his hand and into the back of the net. Madrid ended up lifting the Champions League trophy and Karius' career was just not the same anymore. But it's cool because Liverpool ended up winning the trophy years later against Tottenham. Another strange fiasco happened during the 2014 World Cup qualifier 
but not everyone saw this game. It was the United States versus Costa Rica, and they were playing under some of the worst conditions. It was snowing non-stop and the players were furious. The Costa Rican team even sent out an appeal suggesting that the game should have never been played, but was ultimately rejected. Team US ended up winning the match 1-0. Another bizarre scene occurred when a goalkeeper decided to check his phone during the game. The player played for Atletico Paranaense of the Brazilian league. No one knew what he was doing, but it was just impressive that he was wearing his goalkeeper gloves while handling his phone. There was a lot of drama in the match between France and Kuwait on June 21, 1982, as the latter were losing 3-1. And just like that, Kuwait conceded another goal. Nothing special except that Kuwait's leader at the time decided to march down the stands and confront the referee himself in the middle of the ongoing match. He just couldn't accept the goal and urged the team to leave the pitch. The ref was pressured to disallow the goal and the game continued. They still ended up conceding a goal late in the game. Arsenal has had a lot of legends in their squad over the decades, but none other than Nicholas Bentner's 1.8 second goal can be matched. It's considered to be the fastest goal ever scored as a substitute in the Premier League. The Danish striker came in as a sub and headed a corner set up by Cesc Fabregas against their ultimate rivals, Tottenham Hotspur. Turning your head to check your phone or go to the bathroom when someone scores a goal is always frustrating. But when someone bags a hat trick in 70 seconds is just on another level frustrating. Alex Tor did that during a match between Ross and Springs and Wind Gardens. The team won the game 7-1 with his goals coming in between the 11th and 13th minutes. The team was not ready for it. One of the weirdest incidents was when a referee awarded a player a red card while being subbed off. To put it into context, the player, Samuel Incum, had received a yellow card during the match. The rules of football indicate that any player who takes off their jersey during the game will get a big fat yellow card, no matter what. He saw his name to be subbed off and while walking to the dugout, he took off his jersey, even though he knew he had the yellow card. But he figured, hey, I'm leaving the pitch. What could go wrong? An embarrassing moment happened when the ref had to run up to him and show him the second yellow card, which turned into a red card, and he was sent off. The player waiting to be subbed in couldn't play, and the team had to play one man down. It's a footballer's dream as a child to play for the biggest clubs in the world. Some players decided to do that a little later. Multiple investigations were in action when they discovered that some people have been lying about their age. For example, Goray Muki claimed to be 12 years younger than he was. He was 28 years old when he told his club he was only 16. A penalty shot is always nerve-wracking for both the goalkeeper and the one taking the shot. Lionel Messi, the Argentinian superstar, earned a penalty against Clara Vigo on February 14, 2016. While it wasn't exactly a romantic time, no one expected what he'd do next. Instead of casually taking a kick, he ran down to the spot and passed the ball to the striker, Luis Suarez, in a cheeky attempt to confuse the goalie and excite the crowd. It wasn't the flashiest of moves from Messi, who is considered to be one of the sport's best players in history, but it will go down in history as one of those penalties that will be talked about for a very long time. Football, or how others might know it as soccer, is the most popular sport in the world. It's the national sport in many countries around the world and is especially known in Brazil and Argentina. One thing is certain, the rules of the game aren't constant, but change or amend over the years. And some of the rules are just weird or unexpected. For instance, a player can get a yellow card or a red card for committing a foul and anything that the referee considers wrong. But did you know managers and coaching staff can also be handed the infamous cards? Yep, some managers are known for their raunchy antics on the pitch and sometimes go a little overboard. Referees are allowed to book them yellow cards or even red cards if they cross the line. They will usually miss the next game and be confined to the stands above where the assistant manager will take over. It's even possible to get a red card before a game even starts. If a player decides to act up before the kickoff, 
The referee can hand them a red card and the team will be forced to start the game with only 10 players fielded on the pitch. A manager has to announce the starting 11 players when the game begins, and if someone is given a red card, then the manager cannot replace the player. They will have to start with one player short. So, you better behave. Given that this rule is permitted, no match proceeds if seven players are starting the game. Otherwise, the match will be forfeited. This can be because some players were naughty and got the red card, or if there are some injuries or any other reasons. There can be four red cards given during a game. Otherwise, the match will have to be stopped if more red cards are shown. So what happens if your goalkeeper gets injured? Well, throw in the backup keeper as a substitute. And what will happen if the sub gets a red card or is injured? There's no other goalkeeper backup in the squad, so any outfield player will have to take the goalie's place. They will have to wear gloves and turn on their saving and diving instincts to keep their team above water. Goalkeepers are only allowed to hold the ball for six seconds after saving the ball or recovering it. Any longer than that can result in a booking from the referee since they might consider it to be time wasting. The goalkeeper is the only player allowed to hold the ball with their hands, but only in the penalty box. If they catch the ball outside, they can be booked or sent out depending on the play. A goalkeeper can't pick up the ball with their hands if a player from their team back passes the ball back to them on foot. If so, then it'll be considered a foul. The goalie must receive the pass and play by foot like the rest of them and pass it or clear it away. However, if the goalie receives a back pass by a header or chest, then they can catch the ball with their hands. This also doesn't mean that you can set up your back pass by kicking the ball in the air and heading it for your keeper to pick up. You can get booked for it. If the goalie releases the ball after catching it or holding it in their hands, then they can't pick it up again. If the goalie is caught doing it, then the referee will award the opposing team a free kick outside the penalty area. Years ago, the penalty box was so much smaller than how we know it now. So back then, the free kicks were so close to the net and the human wall blocking it was basically blocking the whole thing. It's almost impossible for the ball to get through. A crazy rule in football is if there are no corner flags, then the game cannot proceed. One of the only times this happened was in the 1974 World Cup in a match between Germany and Holland. The officials forgot to put the flags out, so the referee had to delay the game. But the staff added the flags. The game was okay to start. It was only recently that teams can substitute five players during a game. For a very long time, teams were only able to switch three players during a match. Changing five players means excellent squad rotation for any upcoming matches, especially if the team is competing in multiple competitions at the same time. But there was a point in time where no team was allowed to substitute their players even if one of them was injured. Before 1965, if your team had 11 players on the pitch, then don't expect the bench to help you out. I don't think there was a bench to begin with. Getting substituted is annoying, especially if you're on a roll. But if you refuse to be subbed, then actually nothing happens. You would think that the ref will book you or give you some kind of warning, but nope, the game will resume and the player will be left on the field. While FIFA may not penalize you, your club can fine you and you can lose some of the respect from your team members, the coaching staff and fans. No rule suggests you must put your first or last name on the back of your jersey. You can put whatever you want, as long as it's not offensive. Footballers tend to put their nicknames they've had since they were young. There's no way you can score a goal directly from a throw-in. That's when the ball is out of bounds, so the players have to restart by throwing the ball back in play with their hands. So, if you're trying to be clever and throw the ball directly into the opposition's net without any of your players touching it, then it will just be a goal kick for their keeper. If you're up for a penalty kick and you're face-to-face -face with the keep, then you can pass the ball if you want to. This only works if a foul takes place in the game and not during the shootout at the end of some games. You run and before shooting the ball, pass it to your teammate who can score and take all the glory. If a player scores three goals in a game, then it's called a hat trick, and that player can take the ball home. If a player scores two goals, then it's a brace. You can get booked for taking off your jersey during a celebration or at any point during the game. 
If a player scores a goal and it's disallowed but the player took off his jersey as a celebration, then he will still get booked. If a ball hits a player's hand or arm inside the penalty box, it's an automatic penalty for the opposition team. No, not necessarily. It depends on the play and where the hand is positioned. If the attacker shoots the ball inside the penalty box and the defender is using his arms to defend himself, then it's not a penalty. However, if the defender stretches out his arms to obstruct the ball's projection, then that would be a penalty. Fouling someone is always tricky. And how does the ref know when to hand out a yellow card or when he just gives a free kick and lets the play continue? Here are some red lines that will surely get you a red card. A slide tackle is a foul. However, if you manage to slide the ball instead of aiming for the legs, then the game can continue. It's an automatic red card if you do a slide tackle with both legs from behind. It's also a red card if you accidentally kick someone dangerously. It's impossible to score an own goal from a free kick. If the player decides to pass back to the keeper and somehow the ball goes inside, then the goal won't be awarded. That's only if the only player who touched the ball is the free kick taker. So hold the celebrations. If you ever want to call someone, hoping they won't really answer, try Super Bowl night. Over 100 million people are enjoying America's favorite sports finals, which is the most watched television program of the year. American football is called this way, although you play it with your hands because it developed from two sports, rugby and soccer, known as football in Europe. Also, before some major changes in the rules, they both used hands and feet to play. The 1958 NFL Championship game was the first, and so far the only, NFL title game to ever end in overtime. That night, the Baltimore Colts were playing against the New York Giants. The stadium was full with 68,000 fans, and hundreds of thousands were watching it on NBC. At some point, the crowd got so wild that the NBC cable responsible for the broadcast somehow got disconnected. The game was about to be over at any moment, so they had to do something immediately. Earlier that year, the New York Times asked the producer if they had any plan B for such a scenario. He laughingly answered, they'd probably have to send someone onto the field to delay the game. And that's exactly what they did. They sent their business manager to run up and down the field after the timeout. Officers were chasing him for a while, and everyone thought that was just a rowdy fan. That's how NBC saved the broadcast, missing only the first play out of the timeout. It's hard to imagine a football game without huddles. I mean those times when they all gather in a tight circle to discuss the strategy, motivate each other, or celebrate. But those huddles only became a thing in the 1890s thanks to Paul Hubbard, a hearing-impaired quarterback for Gallaudet. He didn't want the other teams to read his hand signals, so he gathered his teammates in a tight circle to protect their secrets. The 1982 Stanford Cardinal and California Golden Bears went down in history because of the play that unfolded in the final seconds. Stanford had a 20 to 19 lead and there were just four seconds left. You'd think that's nothing, but the time was enough for Golden Bears to turn the tables. They did five backyard passes and bam, final touchdown. They won 25 to 20. Unlike professional football balls, the balls used at college games have white stripes painted at one of the ends to make it easier to spot the ball during nighttime games. Wilson, a famous sports equipment company, has been the exclusive provider of footballs for NFL games since 1941. They now produce 4,000 footballs every day. The first American football game in history was played between Rutgers and Princeton colleges. It was popular among students, but soon became quite a rough sport. At some point, it was even banned to play football in public spaces. Walter Camp, a famous rugby player, became Yale's football team captain and saved the day. He changed the rules of the game and made it a lot as we know it today. The 20-yard line to the end zone is known as the red zone. Red was chosen for the name as it's a warning color for the defense. Once the offense reaches this zone, they are in the best scoring position. Gridiron football is another name for the game. No fun stories here. The only reason is that the playing field does look like a gridiron used in cooking. It seems almost impossible that brothers would be coaching NFL teams that play at the Super Bowl. But it happened in 2013. 
Jim Harbo and John Harbo coached the San Francisco 49ers in Baltimore Ravens and stood against each other at the big game. Their parents were watching in the Superdome. John, the elder brother, won. They briefly exchanged congratulations after the game, but didn't speak for weeks after it. Both admitted that the game was emotionally super hard for them. There used to be the National Football League and the American Football League, each with its own champion, until they merged in 1970. They had to decide about the new structure and couldn't come to an agreement. And guess how they finally solved it? Well, they just dropped five options into a vase and took one out at random. Kansas City Chief Lamar Hunt coined the name Super Bowl as he was inspired by a toy for just 98 cents. His wife found it at a toy store in Dallas, Texas, and told him the little ball could bounce over a small house. Not everyone liked this idea, and there were even contests for a different name, but nothing has beaten the toy-inspired one. The first Super Bowl took place on January 15, 1967. The tickets were just $12, compared to the $100,000 that you'd have to pay for the VIP suite today. Yet, there were still many empty seats at Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, where it took place. They chose the location only six weeks before kickoff. Now it's known three years before the actual game. Ever since the fifth Super Bowl, they have used Roman numbers for identifying the games. It helps avoid some confusion. For example, Super Bowl 2023 would take place at the beginning of that year, but the majority of the season would have been played in 2022. The only exception was Super Bowl 50. The NFL believed naming it Super Bowl L might have lowered ticket sales. The NFL never pays any of those superstar singers that perform at halftime shows. Appearing there at the prime time brings the artists much more money in the long run as their record sales always spike after the game. They do get money to cover the expenses they have to prepare for the show, though. It can be more than $10 million, so that's not a bad deal after all. Each Super Bowl team gets 108 balls, 54 of them serve as practice balls, and another 54 are used during the actual game. The usual halftime of the NFL game is 12 to 15 minutes, but the super halftime is 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the performance that's going on. The coin they flipped at the 44 game to decide which team would start the kickoff had spent 11 days on a NASA spaceship orbiting the Earth. To make sure the game is always fair, there must be seven officials with different functions present on the field. You can recognize them by their black and white striped shirts. The referee is the highest rank among them and has the most responsibilities. Then comes the umpire, the back judge, the head linesman, the side judge, the line judge, and the field judge. Miami has hosted the Super Bowl the most, with 11 games. The runner-up is New Orleans with 10. It normally takes place in a warmer climate or at an indoor stadium. The only exception was the game that took place at Tulane Stadium in New Orleans, when the temperature at game time was 39 degrees Fahrenheit. The Arizona Cardinals are older than the state they represent. The team was founded in 1898, and Arizona officially became a state only 14 years later. The team also had the longest period in NFL history when they didn't win a single game postseason. 51 years! NFL gives the winning team members the Super Bowl rings. Those never repeat each other, as the winners choose how to customize it to make it special. Designing them takes up to four months. The ring will normally have the team name and logo, the world champion's title, and the Super Bowl logo and number. The team can award the rings to whomever they decide, not just players, but coaches, trainers, executives, personnel, general staff, and also former players and coaches. That's why the total price of the set is around $5 million. The Green Bay Packers Super Bowl 45 ring had over 100 diamonds, 13 of them representing every title the team has won since 1929. Decrease time between sets. You do need to rest, but while doing a set, take no more than 30 to 90 seconds of rest between exercises, depending on your level. Make longer breaks between two sets, but not too long, one to three minutes at most. Keep your focus on the workout. Don't scroll through social media feeds, answer calls, text your friends, watch TV, or generally do anything that may distract you. It's better to do all your workout at once and leave other tasks for later. A longer workout doesn't necessarily mean a more effective one. 
find six to eight exercises that work for you and make eight to 15 reps in three sets. If it's too easy, increase the intensity or add weights. For example, if regular crunches are too simple for you, lift your legs at a 90 degree angle or do variations like bicycle crunch or reverse crunch. When you make your workouts more intense, you burn more calories than while having a slow, long training session. Plan your workouts in advance so that you don't lose too much time choosing exercises. You get more efficient when you organize them. Leg day, upper body day, push day, pull day, arms, posterior or anterior workout days, and so on. If you're not sure you can have your training sessions on the same days every week, plan a couple of full body workouts in advance. Muscles grow more when you do isolation exercises, but by doing a full body workout, you'll keep your entire body in shape and simultaneously target multiple muscle groups. Choose exercises that require minimum equipment changes to save time. When you take dumbbells, do a combination of a few exercises you need dumbbells for. For example, bicep curl, bent over row, lunges with weights, or any other exercise that fits your plan. Don't choose an exercise with dumbbells only to switch to a barbell later. You'll waste too much time. Decrease the cadence of each rep. If you're doing a bicep curl, the cadence is the time you need to raise the weight compared to the time it takes to bring it back down. A concentric movement is when you contract the muscles by raising the dumbbell when you're doing a bicep curl. Eccentric is when you're lowering the dumbbell down. That's when the muscle lengthens. To make your workout shorter, you can try two seconds of concentric movement, raising the weights up, and one second of eccentric, bringing it back down. Do supersets. It means you take two or more exercises and do them in a row without taking a break. You can make a superset of lower body exercises in combination with upper body movements. This will engage more muscle groups and reduce your breaks. The upper body will rest while you're performing lower body movements and vice versa. You have a lot of equipment at the gym, but you can easily get it for your home workouts too. Opt for kettlebells. They're some of the best additions for full body workouts. You can use them for endurance, flexibility, strength, and balance workouts. And these are four essential aspects of any training. Kettlebell exercises improve stability, core strength, coordination, increase your range of motion, and help you build muscles. Dumbbells are also great for full body workouts, but here you're limited by techniques. The kettlebell shape offers a more dynamic range of stimulation, and dumbbells are more balanced. Bars are great for upper body major muscle groups. With their help, you can do multi-joint exercises that boost the strength of your biceps, back, abs, and provide you with a better grip. You can do things like hanging knee raises, chin-ups, and pull-ups. Barbells save time. Bench press, squat, overhead press, deadlift. Those are exercises where you can use a barbell to improve your results and use multiple muscle groups. Instead of switching from one machine to another, you get a full body workout by just doing basic lifts. And barbells are great for muscle growth. They also save money. You can buy one and it'll replace all those expensive machines or gym memberships. TRX is also great for full body workouts. You use both gravity and your body weight as resistance to improve your coordination, flexibility, balance, build strength, activate the core, and boost joint stability. Since you're using just one training tool, you can adjust it to your level and switch from one exercise to another in a few seconds. TRX is low impact training. It's not the best choice if you want to gain muscle mass in a short period of time. Machines are also good, but they're mostly available in gyms. Keep in mind that any machine you have to sit on isn't going to be efficient for a full body workout. They're meant for the isolation of a muscle. When you do a difficult workout, your nervous system gets heavily taxed and your body needs a longer time to recover. If you reduce the weight, the nervous system will be able to recover sooner and you'll be more efficient and will end your session faster. Go with more compound movements, which means choosing exercises that target several muscle groups at the same time. Squats with an overhead press or with dumbbells will activate not only your legs and glutes, but also your core and arms. Lunges with a bicep curl will work your legs, biceps, and abdominals that keep your back flat and improve your posture. With two major lifts, all other exercises will be just a good complementary addition that'll help you reach your goal. Like when you have a leg day, 
Two major lifts might be squats and deadlifts with barbells. Try to mix the three main planes of motion or use them in isolation. The frontal plane is about side-to-side -side movements, like jumping jacks. The sagittal plane, such as half burpees, is forward and backward movements. And the last one, the transverse plane, is twisting movements, such as twisting lunges. When you want to have a short but effective workout, make a list where you combine as many different motion planes as you can. You can add lunges, kettlebell swings, or machines to your leg day. If you catch yourself thinking, oh, I'll skip it and do it tomorrow, try the following technique. Get up and do only one minute of running on the spot, jumping jacks, or some other exercise that will warm up your body. Chances are, you'll do 14 more minutes once the couch is far away from you. Don't eat or drink too much right before your workout. Eat your meal two hours before the session and try to munch on something again an hour after. Don't drink too much water during the workout. It'll make it harder for you to do intense exercises, so you'll lose more time getting ready and recovering from the discomfort in your stomach. You'll hydrate your body once you're finished. Even when you don't have that much time, don't forget to warm up. Three to four minutes of warm up will prepare your body to do better throughout the entire training. It'll raise your body temperature, boost your blood pressure, and help reduce muscle soreness. It can be some jogging with high knees or jumping jacks. Doing high intensity interval training is the most common and effective way to increase your workload and reduce your workout time. It's about giving your best in short intervals of time and then taking a small break of 10 to 20 seconds. But HIT isn't ideal for major lifts like barbell deadlifts, squats, bench press, or overhead press. If you want to do HIT, pay attention to your time, not reps. For example, you can perform one exercise for 30 to 40 seconds, then have 10 to 20 seconds of rest, and so on. HIT gets your body going and helps you burn calories. Experiment and choose the training you like. For example, you can set it like this. Jumping jacks, squats, burpees, push-ups, crunches, and the plank. The first FIFA World Cup game in history took place on July 13, 1930, in Uruguay. France won over Mexico with a score of 4-1. to one. Only 13 countries decided to take part in the tournament. Because the number was under 16, it became the only World Cup without qualification games. The Romanian king, Carol II, was such a huge soccer fan that he made it his first and biggest priority to get his national team to play at the FIFA World Cup. He only ascended the throne 35 days before the championship, but he personally selected players for the team, and they submitted the application three days before the deadline. The problem was that most of the players worked for a company that refused to give them a paid vacation for three months. Then. The king himself had to make a couple of phone calls, and the team got on board a liner headed for Uruguay. They made several stops en route to pick up the French squad and FIFA president, Jules René, with the trophy in his suitcase. Later, they also picked up teams Belgium and Brazil. They all shared the ride to save some money. Team Yugoslavia had to travel three days by train to the port of Marseille. They were supposed to share the ship with Team Egypt, but they couldn't make it because of bad weather. It was impossible to do any training on the ships, and the journeys lasted around 15 days. Still, most of the arriving teams won the opening matches. The referee of the final game at the first World Cup was from Belgium. He was wearing a formal jacket with a tie and riding breeches, quite an original choice of an outfit for a sports event. The FIFA trophy was originally named Victory. It was a gold-plated sterling silver sculpture of the Greek goddess of victory, Nike, holding the cup over her head. Several years later, the trophy cup was renamed to honor Jules René. He was FIFA's third president who helped make soccer a global sport and start the World Cup. The trophy was passed over from winner to winner until 1970. That year, Brazil won the World Cup for the third time and got to keep it for good. In 1966, the World Cup trophy was missing for seven days. That year, the tournament was supposed to take place in England. The trophy was on display at a stamp exhibition in London. It was supervised 24-7, 
but a thief managed to break into the security case and steal the trophy on its second day on display. The entire nation followed the search for the trophy that began immediately. The thief demanded a huge ransom, and even when he was arrested, the cup wasn't with him. Then, a black and white mongrel named Pickles saved the day. A week after the theft, Pickles noticed something wrapped in a newspaper beneath a hedge in the garden of his home in South London. The pup made his owner, David Corbett, check out the find. While he was carefully unwrapping the newspaper, David realized the World Cup trophy itself was in his garden. Once it was confirmed that it was real, Pickles instantly became a celebrity worldwide. His owner was given a reward of over $100,000 in today's money and the pup received a lifelong supply of dog food. Several years later, a new trophy was made by an Italian artist who won a design competition. It's a statue of two athletes holding up a globe made of 18 karat gold with bands of malachite on its base. Some scientists claim the globe has to be hollow, or else it would be impossible to lift up the trophy as winners do. No one has seen the first original Jules Rimet trophy since 1983. The Brazilian Football Confederation placed the first original Jules Rimet trophy on display in their office. A group of thieves managed to tie up the building's security, opened the wooden frame of the bulletproof glass box, and took the trophy. The Rio de Janeiro State Bank offered a hefty reward for the trophy's safe return, but the trophy never came back. The most popular version is that the thieves melted it down into gold bars in one of many Brazilian foundries. The system of yellow and red cards was only introduced at the 1970 World Cup. Until then, referees had to tell players they were dismissed. At the tournament in Chile, famous referee Ken Aston wanted to send one of the Italian players off for kicking a Chilean athlete. The Italian didn't speak any English and the referee didn't know a word of Italian. So other players and the stadium security had to drag the player off the field. The remaining game was pretty violent. There was no way for the referee to easily let the players know they had to leave the field. Ken Aston couldn't stop thinking about that game even when he came back home. Once, he was driving down the street in his car, noticed the traffic lights, and decided to introduce the same system to the pitch. It was an instant hit, but officially became accepted by the rules only after a while. According to FIFA rules, players who take part in the World Cup wear shirts with numbers from 1 to 23. Players from Japan aren't excited about wearing the shirt with the number 4 on it, as it sounds similar to demise in their language and is considered unlucky. So they decide at random who's going to wear that shirt. The start of the final match at the 1974 World Cup had to be delayed by 10 minutes. It happened because construction workers at the Munich Stadium had forgotten to install the corner flags. The first game without any goal scored took place only nearly 30 years after the first World Cup. England and Brazil played nil to nil. This was actually the only time Brazil didn't score, and it was because their opponents had really great defensive tactics. The game where the players got a record number of yellow and red cards was in Germany in 2006. At the game between Portugal and Holland, the referee gave out a total of 16 yellow and 4 red cards. The first yellow card was given only after 2 minutes of the game. The FIFA president was so unhappy with the referee that he suggested he should have given himself a yellow card. Right in the middle of the quarter-final game between England and Brazil at the 1962 World Cup in Chile, a dog suddenly ran onto the field. The referee stopped the game, but no one could catch the pup. Then, the English striker Jimmy Greaves, who was a huge fan of dogs, got on his hands and knees and called the canine over. The crowd was cheering, and the pup was happy to be picked up and let Greaves cuddle with it. Brazilian player Garincha was so amazed by the incident that he adopted the pup, and Greaves got himself a nickname, Garincha's Dog Catcher. <laughs> Qatar is set to host the first Winter World Cup in history. All other host countries did it in the summer months. It's going to be the most expensive FIFA event ever. Well, I'm not surprised, since all stadiums will be fully air-conditioned, and the prize money for the winners will be $42 million. 
Some interesting statistics say that a team with a foreign coach has never won the World Cup yet. All the winning team coaches so far have been of the same nationality as the winning team. The country that is most interested in soccer, at least online, is the Solomon Islands. The people living in this archipelago northeast of Australia Google the World Cup the most. French team manager Raymond Domenech led his country in two World Cups. He was a big fan of astrology and believed the players' star signs could affect their performance. He didn't trust Scorpios and Leos as he thought they'd want to show off. So players with this star sign didn't get to play as much as they could. HIT is a set of high-intensity workouts that usually range from 10 to 30 minutes, depending on the exercise select number of exercises and difficulty. There are three planes of motion. The first is the sagittal plane that divides the body right and left halves with forward and backward movements. The frontal plane divides the body into front and back halves, side to side movements. The transverse plane divides the body into top and bottom halves, that's twisting movements. The simple rule is, when you don't have much time and want to achieve the best results, work in as many planes of motion as possible. Here are seven exercises from which you can choose six for a complete multiplanar workout. It's six because humans have limited cognitive ability when we're under stress, and exercise brings stress to our body. So that's how much we can memorize, on average. We'll start with jumping jacks. Level, easy. Stand upright, hold your arms at the sides. Feet shoulder width apart. Relax your shoulders, but keep the core tight to stay straight. Bend your knees a little bit. Jump and extend the arms above your head. As you jump, also open the legs wider. Softly land in the starting position. Jumping jacks are a great exercise to warm up your body before more intense training, such as cardio. You can do it for three to four minutes before the hit session, since it's really simple. As you progress, you can add 30 seconds more until you reach seven to eight minutes. Try to control your breathing. Breathe out when you're jumping up and inhale when going back to the starting position. A common mistake is when you look up or down. Look forward so your spine is in a neutral position and you don't strain your neck. Also, don't lock your knees. You need to slightly bend them while jumping to avoid too much stress on the joints. Next, 180 squat jump. Level, easy to medium. Get in the squat position. Your legs need to be more than shoulder width apart. Abs engaged and tight. Back flat, hips backwards. Jump and turn 180 degrees. Then quickly go back to where you started. That counts as one rep. Hamstrings, glutes, quads. This exercise involves different muscle groups and is easy to medium level. There are variations here too. Simple squats if you don't want or can't jump, or squat jumps without turning to the opposite side. The most common mistake is when you land. Don't fall on your heels, but on your toes. It will take you longer to pop off the heel, also taking a toll on your knees and spine. Always put the correct form before pace. Don't let your knees go too far forward. Try not to push them beyond where your toes end. If you want to make it more challenging, Go down a bit more when you're in the starting position to make your squat deeper. Mountain Climber Cross Level, easy. Start in the plank position. Place both shoulders right above the wrists, belly drawn in. Bring the right knee toward the left elbow with a twisting motion. Start slow if you're at a lower fitness level and then increase the pace as you progress. Common mistake, don't let your hips go down. Engage your core. Keep it firm so your back will stay flat. You can do regular mountain climbers to get used to this exercise and position until you get better. In this case, your left knee goes towards the left elbow, and the same for the opposite side. Half burpee, level easy to medium, also called jump backs or plank jumps. Stand upright, bend the knees, hands are slightly in front of the feet. Hop back with your feet to a high plank or step back if it's too hard for you to jump. When you're in a plank, take a higher position with the hands under your shoulders, feet shoulder width apart. Jump or step to the original position. That's one rep. Common mistake. When your hips go down in the plank position or you don't have a flat back. Russian twists. Level, easy to medium. This is a great way to build your shoulders and core. Sit on the floor, knees bent. 
Straighten the spine at 45 degrees from the ground, making a V-shape with your thighs and torso. Extend your arms straight forward. Interlace the fingers or just clasp your hands together. Use your abs when you're twisting. Go to the right, back to starting position, left, center. This is one rep. Exhale every time you twist. Inhale when you go back to the center. Arms should be parallel to the floor or reach down to tap the floor. You can cross your ankles for better stability. Common mistake. Don't lean forward or let your shoulders end up rounded. The back should be flat, the core firm and engaged. Lateral jumping switch lunge. Level, medium to hard. Start in the lunge position, then jump up and to the side and land in a lunge position with the opposite leg forward. Try to spend as little time as you can on the floor. Common mistakes are leaning forward. Your back should be upright and the core engaged. Also, don't let your knees go too far forward. They're supposed to be bent at 90 degrees. T-rotation or thread the needle. Level, medium. Start in a plank. In a single motion, lift your left hand and rotate to the left side of your body upward until you're turned sideways. Your body and arms are supposed to form a T-shape. Go back to the original position and then do the same move to the right. If you want to up the ante, bring the top knee towards the chest. A common mistake is when your hips sag to the floor. Keep them up by focusing on the core. Keep it tight so your body is a straight line as you're rotating. Make your own HIT session with six exercises. Choose the variation that fits you best. Use an interval timer. Do 20 to 30 seconds of exercise, then 15 seconds of rest if you're a beginner. At an intermediate level, you can do 25 to 30 seconds of work, 10 to 15 seconds of rest. For experts, 35 to 40 seconds of exercise and 10 seconds of rest. Do three sets and take a break between each of them for around two to three minutes. Don't drink too much water before and during the workout. Make up for it afterwards. Warm up before the workout. Either a couple of minutes of jumping jacks, running on the spot, or some other cardio that will prepare your body for intense sets. Start slowly, then increase the intensity. If you're running on the spot, you can do variations such as high knees, gradually increasing the pace, heels touching the glutes. A HIIT workout is short, but not easy. You don't have to do it every day. Try to maintain three times per week, and on non-HIT days, do some light cardio, like cycling, jogging, swimming, or a different type of workout, such as Pilates or yoga. Push yourself to do your best during the intervals. During those 30 seconds, you aren't supposed to be able to talk in full sentences. HIT efficiently burns calories in less time and workouts are shorter than regular training sessions. If you have a flexible schedule, it's best to do it in the late morning. And if you have a regular 9-to-5 job, morning is great to get your body moving. And the evening is good to de-stress. After the HIT, don't forget to have some good sleep, proper nutrition, hydration, and a good stretch. Morning exercise will energize you for the rest of the day, or at least until lunch. So why not give it a try and burn some fat at the same time? It'll only take 10 minutes, so here goes. Bicycle. You don't even need to get out of bed for this one. Lie on your back and raise your knees to your chest. Now straighten one leg at a 45 degree angle above the bed. Then bring that leg back while straightening the other at the same time. Repeat it until it becomes too difficult to keep up the form. You can also level up this exercise by doing bicycle crunches. Put your hands behind your head and, while switching your legs in the air, twist your upper body and bring your elbow to the opposite knee on its way to your chest. Continue this until you can't do it anymore. When you're done, spice it up with some crisscross. Raise both your legs straight at about a 45 degree angle. Put your arms across your body or under your lower back for support and start moving your legs one over the other in a crisscross motion. First get the right ankle over the left one, then switch, all without pausing. Russian twists. Still without getting out of bed, sit with your knees bent, feet firmly planted onto the bed. Lean your upper body back at a 45 degree angle and start slowly twisting your torso left and right. You can speed up, but don't make your moves abrupt or you can harm your muscles and lower back. For an advanced technique, sit in the same position and raise your feet a little off the bed. Then twist your upper body with your feet held like that and don't touch the bed. Jumping jacks. Okay, time to get up at last. 
Stand straight with your feet close to each other and your arms along your body. Then, in a single fluid motion, jump up, spread your legs shoulder width apart, and raise your arms over your head. Without stopping, jump up again and return to the initial position. Keep on jumping energetically and without pause until you feel your heart pumping fast. Side to side hops. Give yourself a little breather and let's keep it coming. Still standing in the initial position for jumping jacks and without changing your posture, hop with both feet to the left and then, without pausing, hop back to the right. Keep your balance and continue hopping to the sides until you start panting a little. Your heart should be pumping again now, and you're probably more awake than ever. Unwind for half a minute, and we'll get to the real fat burners on our list. Squat jumps. Stand straight with your feet shoulder width apart. Raise your arms in front of you and do a squat without lifting your heels from the floor. Touch the floor with your hands and push yourself up with force, jumping up and raising your arms above your head. When you land, go into another squat. This exercise is a beast when it comes to burning calories and training your calves, hips, and glutes. And you can up the ante by turning squat jumps into good old burpees. For that, when you squat, don't just touch the floor with your hands, but put your weight on them and kick back your legs to the push-up position. Then, in a single movement, hop your legs back to the squat position and then jump up. With burpees, you'll also engage your core, abs, and even arms, a pretty universal exercise. And I've got another one for you, which is plank. Nothing can be simpler, yet ironically, harder than the regular plank. Assume the push-up position with your hands propping your upper body and forming a vertical line with your shoulders and your lower body propped on your toes. Your whole body should be straight without any bumps or curves, so make sure your abs and glutes are tense all the time. Stay like that for 30 seconds at first. It should be enough to feel the effect. You can also do it several times during the day as it helps tone your muscles and gives you a healthy jolt of energy for a short time. Let's raise the stakes a little with the elbow plank. It's the same thing, only here you prop yourself on your forearms, not your hands. It might seem easier because of more propping points, but you'll feel the tension in your chest muscles much more accurately afterwards. And finally, the hardest plank level of all, the moving plank. Instead of just staying there, assume the regular plank position and slowly shift to the elbow stance, one arm at a time. Then go back to the regular stance the same way, one arm first, then the other. This exercise is better than push-ups because it doesn't tire you so much and you won't bulk up your muscles, and yet you'll feel your body properly tense as you burn that stubborn fat. But if you're still not satisfied with your plank routine, you can do plank jacks. It's sort of a lying down version of jumping jacks. Stay in the regular or elbow plank position, then jump your feet to the sides about shoulder width apart. Then, without pausing, jump them back together. Keep on going until you get tired. All right, you've done enough sculpting, let's do some stretching. Bridges. A pretty classic exercise that isolates your glutes and hamstrings. Let's start with the easier version. Lie down on the floor, not on the bed, unless you sleep on a slab of rock. Legs bent at the knees and feet firmly planted, arms along your body. You can also put your palms beneath your lower back for better support. Now lift your hips from the floor until they form a straight line with your shoulders. Stay like that for three seconds and go back down. Repeat until the tension is hard, but still pleasant. A more hardcore version of the bridges will stretch your entire body. Lying down on the floor with your knees bent, put your hands palm down next to your head, fingers facing your feet. Now slowly lift your whole body from the floor with your arms and legs. Ideally, your body should form an almost perfect arch, but it can be hard if you're a beginner, so raise yourself as much as you can until the tension in your muscles is too great. Then, lie back down and repeat several more times. V-ups. This one's a pleasant distraction after so much stretching backwards. Lie on the floor, well, just don't get up from it. With your legs straight and your arms extended along the floor over your head. Now slowly exhale and raise both your legs and arms until your fingers and toes meet halfway above your torso. Make sure it's your abs working for that, not your lower back. If you feel too much tension in it, something's not right. For a more intense workout, try crisscross V-ups. It's almost the same, but instead of lifting both arms and legs at once, you only lift the opposite limbs. First your right leg and left arm, making them meet halfway. Then the left leg and right arm, all without pausing. Lateral leg raises. Time for some easy and relaxing exercises to wind down a bit. After all, you've got a long day ahead. Lie on your side and prop yourself on your forearm, legs extended, and one on top of the other. 
Now raise your straight upper leg until you feel tension in your inner thigh and keep it at the highest point for a second. Then lower it back down and repeat. After 10 or 15 reps, turn on the other side and do it with the other leg. Superman! Okay, this is the last one. Lie in your stomach with your arms and legs extended in a straight line. And now, lift both your arms and legs from the floor, balancing on your tummy. You should feel your whole body getting tense, and don't forget to raise your head and look forward. This way, your neck will get some workout too. Alright, you made it! Time to fly away and save the day! Now, let's talk some chess. You know, the game of kings. First, you need a board and some chess pieces. So, how does one pay for their chess sets? Well, cash is always good, but in Sydney, Australia, they'll take a check, mate. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> this whole thing got started, according to legend, that when a young woman became a queen, she sent two of her sons to put an end to an ongoing rebellion in her land. Unfortunately, one of her sons didn't make it through the rebellion. The other son soon realized he was too fearful to bring out the heartbreaking news to his mother. So, he asked for the counsel of the wisest man in the kingdom. His name was Kafalani. Give me three days, the wise man said, and went on to ask for the help of a carpenter and for two different colors of wood, white and black. He then asked the carpenter to make a board out of those pieces of wood and drew 64 squares on it. The wise man then came up with a game using the board and started playing it with one of his students, so that they'd both become proficient in it. It's centered around different pieces, each having specific rules for their movement on the board. The most important piece of the game was the king. This piece needed to be protected at all costs. Once the game was over, the winner would say shamato, which meant the king is helpless. The queen soon found out about Kafalani and his game and asked him to come to court so she could witness the game too. He played it in front of her with his student, and once the game was over, they uttered the ending phrase, Shamato. A wise woman herself, the queen understood Kafalani's message and realized one of her sons was gone. We'll never know if the wise queen's story was true or not, but it's one of the many legends that claim to explain the invention of chess. One of the earliest known forms of chess was called Chaturanga, and it goes back to the 6th century AD. We can trace it back to the northern Indian, the Gupta Empire. The name Chaturanga means the four divisions, meaning infantry, cavalry, elephantry, and chariotry. These were the four types of pieces that were used for playing. It was so popular that it spread to the rest of the world, initially reaching Persia, where it was called Shatranji. The game changed numerous times up until the 15th century with many countries having different variations of the game. In some Asian countries, for example, the pieces were placed at the intersections of board squares, rather than the squares themselves. In Mongolia, the boards were 11 by 10 squares, as opposed to the standard 8 by 8. The 19th century saw both the first chess tournament started, and even the first official world championship, which was hosted in 1886. Wilhelm Steinitz became the first official world chess champion. By the mid-20th century, chess players generally relied on tactics and had an extremely dynamic play. However, with the invention of databases and chess engines, the game was revolutionized and became more predictable. Playing chess became available via websites, and it's estimated that about 600 million people know how to play chess worldwide these days. The movement of the chess pieces on the board is pretty simple, but the game possibilities are endless. Scientists have estimated there are between 10 to the power of 111 and 10 to the power of 123 positions in chess. That's mind-boggling. That's more than the number of atoms in the observable universe, which are estimated to be somewhere between 10 to the power of 78 to 10 to the power of 82. In theory, the longest chess game can have up to 5,949 moves. The longest official game of chess happened back in 1989 and included 269 moves. It took the players over 20 hours to complete and ended in a draw. The most powerful piece on the chessboard is the queen, since it combines the moves of the rook and the bishop. 
Initially, this piece was called the counselor and wasn't so flexible when it came to its range of movement. However, it started to be called a queen sometime in the medieval period in Europe. Some historians argue that this unique piece was able to become the most dangerous on the board by the 15th century because of the many examples of powerful female rulers in that era. This game is so rooted in popular culture that the second book ever printed in the English language was about chess. It was simply called The Game of Chess and was published by William Claxton in the 1470s. We think of the folding chessboard as a neat way to properly store the chess pieces between games, but it was invented with a completely different purpose in mind. For some periods in history, chess was prohibited for many different reasons. In 1254, for example, King Louis IX of France banned chess because he saw it as a useless and boring game. People had to come up with ways to still play the game, so they came up with the folding chessboard. Once closed, the board could easily be placed on a bookshelf and mistaken for two books. We may have stumbled across various ancient chess pieces here and there, but the oldest complete chess sets were found on the Isle of Lewis in northern Scotland. They date back to the 12th century. From their look, scientists believe they were manufactured in either Iceland or Norway. Because of their unique appearance, they were used as source material for various chess pieces in movies. Not only is it entertaining, but chess has many other benefits. Specialists in neurology see it as an effective way to improve memory skills. That's because it pushes the mind to solve complex problems and create the best strategies. Its beneficial effects on young people has led to chess being introduced in some schools in various countries. It's also been linked to higher grades and better behavior. Some chess players got so good at it that they can play with their eyes closed. Janos French, a Hungarian player, set the record in 1960 for playing 52 different opponents at the same time while blindfolded. If that's not impressive enough, he ended up winning 31 of those games. Another impressive chess player was Emmanuel Lasker, a mathematician and philosopher that held the World Chess Champion title longer than any other player ever. He claimed the titles from 1894 to 1921 for 26 years and 337 days, if you're counting. In 1985, a writer, activist, and chess player named Garry Kasparov became the youngest world chess champion to date. He was only 22 years old. Apart from world champion, the highest title a chess player could be granted is that of Grand Master. These awards are given to players for their top-level performances in chess games, and to earn a Grandmaster title, you must win three. Once awarded, the title is held for life, but it can be revoked exceptionally for cheating. But how does one cheat in chess? One of the most common ways these days is to use a computer to help choose better moves, since computers are now way better at chess than humans. In 1997, for example, a computer developed by IBM named Deep Blue became famous for defeating the chess world champion, Garry Kasparov. As for the youngest chess grandmaster in the world, his name is Abhimanyu Mishra from the United States. He broke this record in 2021 at just 12 years and 4 months old. Amazingly, he first learned to play the game when he was just two and a half years old. The position was previously held by Sergei Karaykin, who became the youngest grandmaster at the age of 12 years and 7 months in 2002. The first computer program developed for playing chess was invented in 1951 by mathematician Alan Turing. No computer was powerful enough at the time to process it, so Turing had to test it himself. He performed the calculations and played according to the results, each move taking him several minutes. Thomas Wilson, an English inventor, came up with a tumbling chess clock back in 1883 to help with the gameplay. His invention features a seesaw beam with two equal clocks balanced on it. Before it, chess players used to measure their movements with hourglasses.
So your body needs a little upgrade. Let's inflate some muscles like balloons. First, the shoulders. Now the trapezius and the lat muscles. Now you want to look much bigger and more attractive. And this result can be achieved even from the comfort of your own home. For this, you'll need only a pair of dumbbells. If you don't have them, just use water bottles. Let's work the shoulder muscles. Sit on a chair and lean against the wall. Hold the dumbbells at head level, palms facing forward. Now push the weight up. Make a short pause, then lower your arms to the starting position very slowly. The main principle is to keep the muscles tense as long as possible. Six repetitions are enough. Do three sets of this exercise, then rest for 60 seconds before moving on to the next exercise. Arnold Press Again, get into a sitting position, leaning against the wall. Hold the dumbbells at your chest, palms facing your body, arms bent. Now lift the dumbbells and straighten your arms. At the final point, your arms should twist so your palms are facing forward. Pause and then slowly lower your arms to the starting position. Your shoulder muscles should just burn. As you exercise, your muscles will get micro-damaged. As your body recovers, new muscle tissue will form and you'll gain more muscle mass. Again, three sets of six reps with one minute pause between sets for rest. Now let's get your delts on fire. Continue sitting, but this time lean forward. Hold the dumbbells at your ankles, palms facing each other. Now swing your arms out to your sides. At the top point, your arms should be parallel to the floor. As your arms return to the starting point, try to fight gravity and lower them as slowly as possible. You need to do 10 reps to make your delts get bigger. Rest for 10 seconds and do two more sets. Single dumbbell front raise. Stand upright, grab one dumbbell and hold it with both hands near your waist. Now raise your arms with the weight forward to the level of your head. Slowly return your arms to the starting position. Your shoulder muscles are most tense as you lower your arms. So try to stretch this moment. Do three sets of 10 reps each. Archer push-up. Get into a push-up position. Your arms should be spread wide apart. Move your weight to your right hand and lower your body to the floor. At the lowest point, your whole body should rest on your right hand. Your left arm should be straightened out to the side. Now return to the starting position. Repeat the exercise, only now lower your body to the left arm with the right arm straightened out to the side. For greater effect, combine the exercises in pairs. Do the Arnold press and single dumbbell front raise without pausing. Then let yourself rest for a minute. Then move on to exercises for another muscle group. Now let's make your trapezius bigger. Get into a downward dog stance. Bend your arms and lower your body forward. Be careful with your head, don't hit the floor. When you've reached the lowest point, slowly push your body back. Do as many reps as possible and pause for a minute. Then do two more sets and move on to the next exercise. Scaption. Stand straight, arms slightly bent at your sides, holding dumbbells, feet shoulder width apart. Now raise your arm diagonally forward. Stop where the dumbbells are at head height. Palms should be facing each other. At the top position, your arms should be open like the letter Y. Then slowly return your hands to the starting position. Three sets of 10 reps should be enough. Don't forget to pause for rest between each set. Now lay on your stomach, bend your arms and hold the dumbbells near your head, palms facing down. Raise the dumbbells slightly above the floor. Slowly push the weight forward and straighten your arms. Then bend your arms and move the dumbbells backwards. Try to move your elbows as far back as possible and squeeze the back muscles. Do 8 to 15 reps. If you have strength left, do another set. Dumbbell Shrug Stand straight. Hold the dumbbells at waist level, palms facing each other. Try to raise your shoulders as high as you can. Then lower your shoulders to the starting position. You can make circular movements with your shoulders to be more effective. It's important to keep your back straight and don't let your dumbbell arms swing. Do as many reps as possible. Your shoulders and trapezius should just burn. Then rest for a minute and do another set. Dumbbell Snatch Stand straight with your feet shoulder width apart. The weight should be on the floor parallel to you. Sit down and grab the dumbbell with one hand. Your weight should be on your heels. Now push with your feet and start getting up with the weight. At the same time, lift your arm and bend near your chest with your palm facing you. Then push off with your legs again and push your arm up and straighten it over your head with the palm forward. Only now, your legs should be straight. Return to the starting position. Lower your arm with the weight to your chest and bend your legs slightly. 
Then lower the weight to the floor and squat down completely. This is a blast exercise for your back, but you need to be well warmed up so you don't get injured. If you do 10 reps for one arm and then 10 for another, this will also be great cardio. Now we'll make your wings bigger. Dumbbell pullovers. Lie down on a bench and grab one dumbbell with both hands. Place it straightened out behind your head. Lift your arms up toward the ceiling. Then lower your arms back down, squeezing your back. The more you tense those muscles, the better. Do 15 reps and take a pause to rest. Three sets would be perfect. Dumbbell row. Take a dumbbell in your right hand. Use your left knee and left hand to lean against the bench. Your body should be almost parallel to the floor. Your right arm with the weight should be straight, hanging down. Lift the weight towards your chest. Keep your core tight. Engage your back and lat muscles to lift the weight. Now slowly lower your arm with the dumbbell. If the weight is heavy enough, do 10 reps for each arm. Then rest for a minute and repeat the exercise. Renegade Row Take the push-up position, only now you have to lean on the dumbbells. Palms facing each other, move the weight to the left hand. Lift your right arm with the weight to your side. Then lower your arm to the floor and repeat the exercise with the other arm. Do 10 to 15 reps. If it's too hard, do the exercise with your knees on the floor, and you can always reduce the weight of your dumbbells. We need to keep our muscles tight, not injured. Belly Penguins Lie down on your stomach and lift your chest and head slightly. Straighten your arms and turn your palms up. Arms should be slightly apart. Then squeeze the right lat and try to reach with the right hand as low as possible. Return to the starting position and repeat the exercise on the other side. Try to tense the left and right sides equally. Otherwise, your muscles will grow and imbalance. This will be bad for your back and posture. Reverse Snow Angels Continue to lie on your stomach. Arms straightened forward. Brace your back and lats. Then raise your arms and move them back as if you were trying to draw a snow angel. You need to raise your arms as high as possible to pump the lats. Do as many reps as you can. Pulse Row Stay on the floor. Place your arms at your sides away from your body. Palms facing the floor. Then raise your chest and arms above the floor as high as your lats will allow. It's important to pause for two minutes at the top point. Only then return to the starting position. To make your lats burn, combine several different exercises into one set. Belly penguins, then renegade row, and reverse snow angels at the end. Pick a few exercises for each muscle group and practice 15 to 20 minutes a day. The main thing is to keep your muscles tight the whole time. Don't forget to do a good warm-up before the workout. And after you load the muscles, be sure to let them rest so they can recover for the next workout. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like.